Hi, welcome to video three of the Master of the Nerves course. So, quick recap. Video one, we discussed how our minds evolved and basically do a lot of thinking in order to solve problems, keep us alive. And we called all that thinking our thinking self. And we drew a difference between that and our ability to just watch that chaos, I suppose, unfold. And we called that our observing self. And in the last lesson, our session, we looked at how our minds love problem solving and how we've no doubt come up with a heap of ways to try and manage, control, reduce, eliminate our nerves or anxiety. But perhaps maybe we don't find they work as often uh, as we would like them to. So in this lesson, we're going to learn to unhook from our minds, to learn and practice skills that help us step off the roller coaster of our thinking self and spend a bit more time in that observing self. These were skills actually that Emily, a 32 year old basketball player, had taken into her sport. Previously, Emily would worry about making mistakes and letting her team down. But in time and with practice, she started noticing that it was like her mind just defaulted into ways of thinking on the morning of matches. Those doubts and those worries and those anxieties and so on would just surface often without her even having to do anything. Emily decided that she was sick of being bossed around or bullied, so to speak, by her mind and instead started to thank her mind for its contributions and focus on whatever it was she was doing in that moment. A metaphor that Emily seemed to resonate with was thinking of all her thoughts as if they were clouds. Thoughts can drift by, often we're not aware or certainly not attached to them too much. We can look at them and treat them for what they are right now. You're, you're, you're no doubt thinking, hopefully taking in what I'm saying and assuming you're not having a massive reaction to my chat, maybe judging it as nonsense and so on, then most thoughts will just be slipping by often like the clouds. However, in some contexts, like our performance contexts, like when we want to be at our best, our mind maybe starts telling us we have to win, reminding us of how stupid we are if we fail or make a mistake and we maybe find ourselves hooked into those thoughts. They, they become the total lens through which we see the world and when that happens, they become all consuming and the thoughts in our mind can make us more and more anxious. But here's the thing. When we're in those darker places, if you like, when those thoughts are bigger and darker and the feelings have become more and more stronger, we probably try loads of strategies to get rid of the thoughts, to make them go away, to stop thinking them. And maybe sometimes it might help, as we discussed uh, in the previous video, but other times, well, it can be, I suppose, as useful as pausing this video, standing on your front doorstep and shouting at any clouds in the sky to go away. No matter how ingenious we become at make or trying to make the clouds disappear, it makes a little difference. And all the time, whatever it was we were doing back inside that is more meaningful and important to us, which if you like speaks to our deepest values, well, that's just being neglected because we're being that person standing on the street shouting at the sky. So what Emily had learned was skills to help her notice when she was feeding those bigger clouds, those scariest thoughts, those worries and feelings of anxiety and so on. And instead had learned ways of unhooking from the clouds to let them drift on past despite how big and scary they seem. Now, don't get me wrong, Emily would be the first to admit the clouds still show up often when going into big games or when it's getting tight. She also knows it's what her mind does. She doesn't need to entertain it. Instead, she can let the thoughts come and go and focus on whatever it is she has to do in that moment. She had, if you like, increased her tolerance of these clouds, these thoughts and these feelings. So then let's look 
at some ways we can maybe practice unhooking from what goes on inside our minds. Now, to do that, we're going to go through five strategies that you can try right away to begin practicing unhooking from when your mind's being unhelpful. And given what's gone before in this course, I hope it's not too much of a surprise to know that what follows are pretty unconventional methods to unhooking from your mind. I mean, it's nothing drastic, um, but it certainly flies in the face of perhaps what people might call common sense um, or what people traditionally think sports psychology is. And remember, that's because we've highlighted that trying to control or lessen our nerves through fancy techniques often doesn't pan out to be the magical solution we hope it would be. And perhaps then it's worth re-emphasising here that before we dive into these five strategies, if you like, the aim here is to actually develop is actually to develop the psychological muscle of unhooking when the mind is being unhelpful. It's if you like to begin increasing our tolerance of unwanted thoughts and feelings, accepting them as part of the ebb and flow of having a mind, not to try and get rid of and to try and control our minds. So let's go for it. The first one we're going to look at is quite a simple one. Give your mind a name. That part of your mind that thinks all the time, analyzes, predicts, problem solves, plans and, and, and so on. I've been calling it our thinking self and you've probably noticed me sort of trip over it a, a couple of times. And that's because it's quite a clunky way of speaking about things. G give it a name. Nothing threatening or degrading, just a name by which we can call our mind. I speak about my mind as Jeeves, as I imagine a bit like a like a butler serving me sometimes helpful, sometimes unhelpful thoughts pretty much all day. And also an image just because of that early day search engine, Ask Jeeves. So what's the name of your mind? We might also choose to, if you're, if you're artistically um, inclined, you might choose to quickly caricature your mind on a post-it note or a piece of paper. You don't have to, but that would be a, a, a simple extension of this task. And I wonder then, having now got a name for our mind, I wonder if we can tune into what our mind is saying. Can you notice whatever it is your mind is telling you right now? So for, for me, what is Jeeves saying just now? And, well, I guess he's saying that this all sounds daft and why would anyone believe this? And this isn't what people think sports psychology is and so on. But I guess Jeeves, just, Jeeves is just doing his thing there. He's, I guess, trying to protect me keep me in the in-group, so to speak, in some way, shape or form, not to be castigated. It's my mind just being a mind. And I wonder if you can do that, tune into your mind, having given it a name. I wonder what differences you notice about your relationship to what's going on inside your head. Maybe you'll notice that you're able to get closer to that observing self that you're not quite on the roller coaster as much with all those thoughts. The next one that many people find helpful is to then also name the story that the mind has given them. This one encourages us, I suppose, to treat our thoughts that our mind has given us as akin to stories, similar to stories. For example, the I'm going to fail story might have a, a load of thoughts like last time I did this, I failed, it's going to happen again, they're all going to judge you and it won't be good, or if you fail, then it proves you don't deserve to be here and so on. Uh, maybe you have other thoughts. If you have a, a tendency to think that I'm going to fail, story. In fact, you may have totally different stories and multiple ones at that. All, all, of course, totally normal and part of having a mind. But the point here is to take a step back from the content of your mind, the stuff that your mind comes up with, and, and instead just notice what's going on. And if you like, stick a label on it like, ah, that's the I'm going to fail story or the, ah, I'm damn not good enough story or everyone's watching me story. So we're trying not, in doing this, we're trying not to get dragged into thinking about the validity of any particular thought or debating how true or accurate it is or trying to make it more positive. Simply, if it isn't helping you, 
you can notice the mind beginning to find its groove in such a story and, uh, well, name the story, stick that label on it, which I guess requires us to be in that observing self mode a little bit. So let's give it a go right now. Tune in to what your mind is saying to you. And if it isn't up to much, maybe it was telling you something earlier today. And if you could give all that stuff a name, a label, if you were to name that story, what might it be? I suppose for me, building on what Jeeves was telling me in the previous example, I guess I could call that this is rubbish story. Perhaps you can relate to that when you're doing something you care about, or, or maybe not. But what story is your mind giving you? And can we name it? And again, if you're managing to do that, I wonder what differences you notice just now. Do you feel as attached to your thoughts, as close to them, or do you notice that there's maybe a little bit more of a distance as you're able to, if you like, take up a bit more space in that observing self mode that we've spoken about way back in video one? And the third one just continues to strengthen that psychological muscle of getting into that observer mode and, and off that roller coaster. And, and I guess by doing so, it challenges us to thank our mind for its contributions. And this can be a tricky one because we can become so frustrated with ourselves and our mind that we can maybe do this in, I suppose, bad faith. We can, you know, try and thank our mind, but do it in a snidey way, which, you know, probably won't help as all you're really doing is kind of berating yourself. So instead, if we can start from a position that our minds are trying to solve problems to keep us safe, and really it's like the mind's trying to be helpful, but maybe isn't in any given moment. So we might think of our mind as an overly helpful friend or, or butler in the case of Jeeves. Sometimes helpful, sometimes not. And as we probably do with our friend, we can appreciate the mind's efforts to help. So maybe we can try and thank our mind for what it's doing. After all, it's only doing what it's evolved to do. So again, give it a go. See if you can generate some thoughts or stories, if you like, that, that you often find yourself buying into, being hooked by, which leads to feelings of anxiety or nerves. And try just thanking your mind for its contributions, appreciating, I suppose, its efforts as an overly helpful friend. And look, I, I appreciate that this and arguably all these may feel a bit forced or contrived, but I hope you're able to experience some subtle shifts in your relationship with your mind. So as with the previous strategy, I wonder what differences you maybe notice by doing this. And again, it doesn't have to be anything drastic, but once more, it's about trying to strengthen that psychological muscle of helping us step off the roller coaster of our thinking selves and stand, I suppose, in that observing self mode. And now we're on to the fourth one to, to try. And I guess building on this caricaturing or characterization of our mind thing that we've got going on, let's practice giving our mind a new voice. So if, like me, when you think, you'll, you'll probably be thinking in your own voice, so to speak. And, and maybe you're not quite aware of it. And because the content of our mind, all the chatter and all those thoughts, comes at us in our own voice, it can sometimes make it feel pretty believable, whatever it is that we're thinking. I mean, try it out. Take a thought you often have that's somewhat self-critical and kind of gets you down. And for the next 10 seconds, really focus on that thought, like really buy into it and just play it over and over your head and try and really believe, believe it. So see if you can catch a thought, any thought, sort of thought you have that's overly or tends to be pretty critical of yourself. And for the next 10 seconds, just repeat it over and over in your head and really try again appreciate this maybe feels a wee bit contrived but really try and buy into it for 10 seconds just repeating it over and over in your head and as you're doing that i wonder how you notice how, how you're feeling i imagine you're maybe feeling a wee bit more rubbish so to speak and hopefully you've noticed that it was probably in your own voice, those thoughts. So let's take a try something different. 
let's take the same thought you just focused in on and refocus on it again for 10 seconds, but this time in the voice of, uh, I don't know, um, Homer Simpson or Kermit the Frog or Miss Piggy. Basically almost, I guess, any sort of cartoon character whose voice is easy for you to sort of recall and, and play in your head. And once you've got that character, so I'm going to go um, for Homer Simpson, for 10 seconds, let's see if we can focus on the same thought, but as if it's the voice of the cartoon character saying it. So for 10 seconds, let's give it a go, starting now. And as with previous examples, I wonder what you're noticing from doing that. If it, if it worked for you, take a note that it's the exact same content that your mind, Jeeves in my case, is giving you, but it's just dressed or, or sounded differently. It doesn't change the content. It doesn't try to make it more positive or less negative or to ignore it or to push it away. But it does change, I suppose, maybe our relationship with the thought. And I guess maybe it treats our thoughts for what they are, often just thoughts. And so the final one just builds on this a little bit more. And let's take another thought then that often bothers you in sport. Maybe spend a wee minute just try to catch again a self-critical or nervous or anxiety related thought for you. And for 10 seconds again, see if you can buy into it and repeat it over and over in your mind. We'll do that starting now. So self-critical, judgmental, anxiety, nerve-provoking thought. See if you can play it in your mind over and over. And hopefully that'll be hitting you a wee bit, maybe not massively, it's, it's out of context, but enough that you're able to trace the contours of its effects on you, maybe it's feeling those nerves so that, if you like, adrenaline begin to build. Now try saying, I'm having the thought, just taking that, I'm having the thought, whatever it was that you were having, and putting that before the thought itself. So for example, if I'm consumed by the thought, I'm going to fail, that's what Jeeves is telling me, I'd say, I'm having the thought, I'm going to fail. Yeah, so I'm taking the words, I'm having the thought, and I'm putting it at the start um, of the thought itself. So try that for your thought that you just had, or you were working on for those 10 seconds there just now. Put in the words, I'm having a thought, at the start of it. So for 10 seconds, we're going to focus in and just practice repeating it with, I'm having a thought, whatever your thought is, for 10 seconds. Let's try that. And I'm hoping as you do that, you maybe notice there's a little bit of distance between you and the thought. You're not trying to push it away. You're not trying to get rid of it. You're just noticing it. And now just try that then, extend that and put in, I notice I'm having a thought before, whatever that thought is. So mine would be, I notice I'm having the thought that I'm going to fail. So try that with your thought. For 10 seconds, just tune in on that, but see if you can practice and notice the differences from putting in, I notice I'm having the thought before the actual thought. And again, hopefully you notice there's a bit of a sense of distance from the thought. Maybe a sense that the thought is just a thought, that it isn't as believable. Because that there's, I guess there's a sense maybe in doing that, that there's a, then a choice that we can make. You can then engage with that thought, if it's helpful, or not, and we can let it go and drift on by as a cloud. And, and I guess what these simple exercises are designed to do is to help us unhook from our active mind, to let it do its thing but give us a bit of a distance. And with that wee bit of distance we maybe have a little bit more choice as to how we proceed in this moment and the next, well in whatever performance context that we are in. 
Because after all, any performance is arguably the combination of well-executed moments preceding it. So if we can unhook from our minds, if we can practice some of these skills, we maybe give ourselves a bit more of a choice as to figure out what is most helpful in any given moment. And by the way, that might be to go with whatever it is your mind, Jeeves in my case, is telling you. But at least that's a choice rather than being the hostage on the roller coaster of our mind. And I think I just want to re-emphasize here that our objective when we unhook and practice unhooking from our minds is not to eliminate unwanted thoughts or feelings. Because that's often the futile way forward. Instead, it's to start developing the tolerance or willingness to allow these experiences to be part of the ebb and flow of being human who's wanting to do, do well in whatever it is they're doing. Heck, dare I say it, and as alluded to in this cartoon, our objective is to maybe be a wee bit kinder to our demons, our more nervous self. And that is a, a lifelong task in itself. I'd hate for anyone to think that I am the master of this myself. I, I, I am not. I fall off quite often and, and find myself wrestling with thoughts and feelings, um, which, which really works. Something the Buddhists do say that I think is helpful is begin again. And that's all we can do with our minds that are constantly thinking. All we can do is just begin again with practicing to unhook because we will get hooked. But these skills are about trying to build that muscle of unhooking. So in this video, I guess we have looked at how, you know, thoughts and feelings and difficult ones like that show up all the time. But we often maybe don't pay too much attention to them until we're doing something that we, we care about or that we run the risk of being judged or making a fool of ourselves. And that's when we can get hooked. By them, we we get dragged along the roller coaster of our thoughts and feelings, um, and subsequently our thinking selves. And in this video, we've tried to put on the table, or have put on the table, five strategies, I suppose, to help develop that muscle for unhooking um, from all these thoughts. And we really have to be accept, I suppose, that we're going to have to begin again. We are going to have to constantly practice unhooking because our minds will just go and they will always just go because sometimes that's a helpful thing. And in the next video, what we're going to do is, well, when we have found ourselves able to unhook for perhaps the briefest of times, what can guide our actions then? So in the next video, we're going to start looking at well, what is our values that were to guide us in any moment when we are able to unhook.